Welcome to our Galatians study for May 26, 2024. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I, I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Today we are in our Galatians study, and we have for the last couple of weeks looking at that transitional period when Paul receives the mystery gospel in Acts 9.23 and then what happens afterward with that, uh, especially with Israel because the focus in Galatians, in Galatians 1.6, he says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. They had believed the gospel of grace. They trusted in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for their sin. But you had some Judaizers who had come in and they tried to get him to say that you had to be circumcised to be saved. In Acts 15 and verse 1, certain men, Acts 15 verse 1, certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. And we see in Galatians, if you go to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 2, Paul says, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Verse 4, Galatians 5, 4, Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. And then if we look in Galatians chapter 6, verse 12, As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Verse 15, Galatians 6, 15, for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. So Paul's gospel is Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Now Galatians is probably written after the Jerusalem Council of Acts 15, which is at least 14 years after the uh, the mystery program begins because Paul says in Galatians 2 verse 1 and referring to the um, the Jerusalem council he says then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also so you have Paul preaches Jesus death burial and resurrection then the there has been a combo that has been added here where you take um, we're going to call it the Judaizers here and what they are preaching is uh, yeah Jesus death burial resurrection plus circumcision Acts 15 is developed in if you are not circumcised after the manner of Moses you cannot be saved so they're adding circumcision and what Paul does is he shows you here in Galatians 5 verse 2 uh, Galatians 5 2 at, uh, that in, in verse 4 Galatians 5 2 um, <clears throat> under circumcision Christ profits you nothing you are fallen from grace so this is why this is such a big issue is when you take Jesus death burial and resurrection and you add something then what you're doing is you're canceling out the death burial and resurrection and now as he says there in Galatians 5 3 you're a debtor to do the whole law so here's a verse 
Let's throw this verse out here. And we are going to talk about Peter preaching the mystery gospel today, uh, but just giving you a background of what's going on in Galatians, because really Galatians is our text. Um, it says in Romans 11 and verse 6, if by grace, Romans 11, 6, if by grace it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace, but if it be of works, then is it no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. So you learn in Romans 11, 6, that grace plus works, they do not mix. So when you're saved by grace, here, Paul's gospel, and then you add the work of circumcision. You add the law or works. Then what you're doing is now, as Galatians 5.3 says, debtor, you are a debtor to do the whole law. He says in Galatians 5.4 that you are fallen from grace. So what the law does, uh, the law cancels out grace because Romans 11 6 if it's by grace then it's by grace if it's by works it's by works but when you put the two together they, they don't mix uh, you, you can think of it sort of like uh, you know a glass of water because the Holy Ghost is the living water so you got your water here pure water I could just add a little dirt to it and now it's dirty water and you say, well, why are you calling it dirty water? I mean, it's pure water. Oh, it's 99.44% pure. You know what they say about ivory soap? 99 and 44 hundredths pure. I don't know what that meant, but how they came up with that. Just some slogan, I guess. But if it's 99.44% water and it's 0.56% dirt, well, then it's dirty water. We say, well, it's mostly water. Yes. But once you add dirt, it's no longer good water. It's dirty water. And, of course, the Holy Ghost being a type of the water, living water. And so, that's what's going on with the Galatians. Is you've got Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection alone is preached, grace. But then, these Judaizers come in and they preach circumcision. Law plus works. And, and today, and when you do that then, Christ prophets you nothing, you've fallen from grace. And now you got to do the whole law. So just like I don't have pure water once I put in a little bit of dirt. It's no longer clean water. It's dirty water. Once you put a little works or the law into grace, it's no longer grace. It's basically dirty grace. And so uh, you've fallen from grace. And what he's doing in Galatians 1 is he's giving you a history of what took place. So he says in Galatians 1 6 that uh, you know some people are troubling you and they're preaching this gospel here Jesus death burial and resurrection plus circumcision and uh, he says the gospel I got he says in Galatians 1 11 and 12 it was by revelation of Jesus Christ no one taught me this uh, and so they think and this is what people do today is they'll try to take Israel's gospel and they'll mix it with Paul's gospel. In most every single church out there, I know Salvation Army doesn't do it, maybe there's one other, but every other denomination has water baptism in there. So now today's gospel, or today's Judaizers, if you want to call them that, what they're doing is they're saying, now a lot of times they don't preach the pure Jesus, death, burial, resurrection. They add, invite Jesus into your heart, make Jesus the Lord of your life, uh, confess your sins, walk an aisle, say a prayer, all this stuff. But uh, let's just say they did get it right, because some churches do, and they teach Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for sin. But then they add water baptism. Because if you add works, it doesn't matter. He says you're a debtor to do the whole law, Galatians 5, 3, once you add in works or you add the law in there. And, and so it doesn't matter if it's circumcision, water baptism, whatever. And the, the issue, the reason people do that is because of your flesh. Uh, I've noticed mo pretty much, uh, I go ahead and say, 100% of all false doctrine is due to your flesh. 
you know, maybe not yours specifically, but other uh, people's flesh too, that this doctrine comes about. And he said in Galatians 6.12, Galatians 6.12, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Galatians 6.12, uh, if 100% grace, your flesh persecutes you, and everybody else's flesh too. When you take a stand on the truth of God's word, then, the, then you're going to be persecuted by your flesh and by other people's flesh. And so if it's 100% grace, your flesh doesn't like it. So um, it will persecute you. You'll suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. So what they do is they add in works so then they don't have to suffer. I mean, nobody likes to suffer, right? I mean, that's why pain medication is such a big deal. People taking pain medication because they don't like to be in pain. And I can understand that. But we need to look at the long-term picture and understand that whatever happens in the flesh is going to perish away. But everything done in the spirit will last forever. And so uh, that's what we need to focus on, even though it means suffering in the flesh. So what Paul does in, in Galatians 1 and 2 is he has to give a history to show that we don't listen to the Judaizers, that they're preaching a false gospel. Paul was a Jew, and he grew up a Pharisee of the Pharisees, he says in Philippians 3. He knew the Jewish laws and the different things, but he gave that up when Christ, as he said in Galatians 1.15, when God separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace to reveal His Son in me, that I might preach Him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. So, uh, call me by His grace, reveal His Son in me. So now He comes out of the law, and now He's preaching Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is atonement for sin. And uh, so now I'll just give you a brief history and what we're going to do now is we're going to see that we're looking at that transitional period of what happens uh, in Israel, specifically in Jerusalem, um, as a result of this dispensational change. So we saw last time we correlated Acts 9.23, talks about many days. So Acts 9 and 23 says many days. And that is going to equal the three years that we find in Galatians 1. He says in Galatians 1, verse 18, after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. So this right here, the many days of Acts 9, 23, is the three years of Galatians 1, 18, and this is the start of the grace dispensation or the mystery program, whatever you want to call it. Um, mystery. So then what happens with that? Then he says, he went to Peter and abode with him 15 days. Now verse 19, Galatians 1, 19, Other of the apostles saw I none, save James the Lord's brother. So Galatians 1, 18 and 19, he's with Peter 15 days. He also saw James, which is the Lord's brother not one of the original 12. So the, um, James, the son of Zebedee, is the James uh, of the 12. Uh, James, the Lord's brother, was an unbeliever um, when Jesus was alive. I don't know when he becomes a believer. Maybe shortly thereafter at his resurrection. I don't know. Uh, I know that in Mark 3, you've got James and Mary and Mary's uh, other sons, coming to commit Jesus to the funny farm, thinking he's crazy. So you know James isn't saved at that point. Uh, and he could not be one of the twelve because uh, you had to start with John, be a saved person from John the Baptist, and be throughout uh, Jesus' ministry. You know, Paul says, I am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So Paul is not qualified to be one of the twelve. James, the Lord's brother, isn't either because he wasn't saved it until after, probably until the resurrection, would be my guess. Um, but, but 
we don't know. We're not given those details. Uh, so now, this here correlates here. So after the three years, that right there proves that Paul is not preaching uh, a like a Judaizer gospel. And, you know, that's what people do today. The pure gospel, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, they are water baptism. Back then, the Judaizers took Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection at its circumcision. It doesn't matter as long as you add circumcision, water baptism, you add some kind of law, then you are a debtor to do the whole law because grace and works do not mix. <coughs> Just like dirt cancels out clean water, law cancels out grace. And so Paul has to make it clear that this message of the Judaizers is not what he's preaching. And, and, and so he's going through these details here. So, uh, verses 19 and 20, uh, he spends time with Peter with 15 days, and the only other apostle he saw, it says, um, James, the Lord's brother. Now, we go back to Acts chapter 9, and let's get the parallel verses for that. So, in Acts chapter 9 and verse 27, it says that Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. First, we should have started with verse 26. Acts 9.26. Acts 9.26. When Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, and believed not that he was a disciple. So I think what's... So, so they're all afraid, but then Barnabas took him, verse 27, brought him to the apostles, declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And so what happens from that apparently, remember Acts is giving you Israel's history, and Galatians is giving, talking about the body of Christ. So you've got two different groups here. Now there could be, say, members of Israel as part of the body. There is some overlap there. But for the most part, you've got Acts written to Israel explaining the dispensational change and everything specific to what happened with the Jews. And you've got Paul and Galatians specifically talking about what happens to the body of Christ. And so this here, the Galatians 1, 18 and 19, correlates with Acts 9, 26 and 27 here. That he goes to, it's after three years, he has been preaching the mystery, God. he preaches the mystery gospel in Damascus, and they want to kill him there in Damascus, so then he goes to Jerusalem. And basically he tries to join himself to the disciples there not that he's going to preach the same message not that he's going to preach israel's program it's a different message but he wants israel to be saved his call in acts 9 15 acts 9 15 said his call is to bear my name the lord says before the gentiles and kings and the children of israel paul is called to all unbelievers both jew and gentile and since Paul is a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, he says in Romans and verse uh, Romans nine and verse three, Romans nine three, I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites. He says in Romans ten verse one, Romans ten verse one, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. But Paul has a great desire for Israel to be saved. That's why he goes to Jerusalem. He's not looking for a stamp on his ministry that says, Certified Apostle Paul. You are certified by the twelve apostles or by Israel. Um, because he says, even in Galatians 2, he mentions when it talks about coming to the Jerusalem council in verse 6, Galatians 2, 6, of these who seem to be somewhat whatsoever they were and maketh no matter to me God accepteth no man's person so it didn't matter to him he's not saying oh I gotta get the stamp of approval you know a lot of times we're looking for man's favor 
because unfortunately that's what people look to. They look to man for the answer. They'll say, you know, this Bible stuff is complicated. I don't have the time. Even if I put in the time, I'm not going to understand it. I'm so confused. So I'm just going to find me a pastor and I'm going to follow whatever he says. He is going to be God's represent, representative for me. Just like I don't know how my body works. There are people who have been trained as doctors, you know, 10 years of school and 20 years of experience treating patients. So I'm just going to trust whatever they say. If I need a colonoscopy or if my blood pressure is too high or, uh, you know, whatever you say, I'm doing it. You know, I'm taking the test. I'm taking the medication. I'm doing whatever you say because you're the expert. I'm not. And that's how people look at uh, God and His Word. They say, I'm not the expert. I'm going to go to some guy who's been to cemetery school. He's learned all this stuff. He studies it all the time. And so I'm not going to study it. I'm just going to believe whatever this guy says. And so uh, the natural tendency of man is to look for that stamp of approval. But Paul says, that's not what I'm doing. The issue is Romans 9... Romans 9 and verse 3 and 4. So Romans 9, 3 and 4. And also 10, Romans 10 and verse 1. Romans 10 verse 1. Paul wants Israel saved. And I'm going to put saved under grace, meaning, I mean, there is grace in Israel's program, don't get me wrong. But uh, maybe I should say under uh, the mystery. Maybe that's a better way of saying it. Under the mystery gospel. He understands that Israel has been set aside with the stoning of Stephen. He understands their history of apostasy. And he says, well, now they got a renewed opportunity. And uh, it's a different situation, new dispensation. So now maybe they'll get saved now. Their entire history has been in unbelief. You only have a few believers as time goes on. But now, maybe they'll finally be saved. And so he says, I'm going to go up to Jerusalem. Now that I've learned this information, I've got the mystery gospel, I've got sound doctrine, I've learned it for three years, I'm going to go up to Jerusalem and I'm going to meet with the apostles. Because even though I don't care about their stamp of approval, and I'm not going to change what I teach to please them, what I want them to do is to accept the dispensational change the mystery gospel, the sound doctrine for that, and then they can maybe be that audience, you know, get into the Jewish churches then and be able to preach the mystery gospel because um, they had the stamp of, Paul would have that stamp of approval from them. The apostles, they, um, you know, Paul is a Jew, so he could go into the Jewish synagogue and preach, but if he's known for persecuting believers, um, you know, people are going to want to listen to him. So uh, he's looking for that, not the, not the stamp of approval for himself, but for, um, for his ability then to reach and get Israel saved. So he wants to go in Jerusalem saying, yeah, I've talked this over with the 12 apostles. They agree. They understand that a dispensational change has occurred, that it's not recognize your sin, confess your sins, get water baptized to believe the, and trust in God to save you. That's not the gospel anymore. The gospel is trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin. The middle wall partition between Jew and Gentile has come down and uh, all then are saved not through Israel but just believe Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin. You have eternal life. You have Christ in you. He wants to preach that to get Israel saved. So he goes up to Jerusalem as he says there in Galatians chapter 1. Um, let me get the wording here because this tells you what he's, uh, the reason he did this. Galatians chapter 1. Uh, he goes up to Peter. He goes up to the twelve. But the problem is he only sees Peter and James, and James isn't even one of the twelve. So he only sees Peter of the twelve. And so, uh, because, Acts 9, 26, they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. 
And we mentioned last time, this proves positive that this is a dispensational change. Uh, because in Acts 5, verse 1, Peter uh, knew that Ananias was lying and Sapphira were lying to the, the Holy Ghost uh, about the keeping back a portion of the proceeds from the sale of the land or the possession. And so uh, they're struck dead. So the Holy Ghost is communicating with Peter what's going on in the hearts of people. Uh, but the, now you get to a dispensational change and they don't know this anymore. They don't have that supernatural link. You don't have the Holy Ghost telling the twelve, Paul is now a believer. I've saved him by my grace. I've started a new dispensation. Uh, they got to figure this out themselves. Now they still have the Holy Ghost, but what they got to do is they've got to overcome the flesh and uh, look at it compared to Scripture and figure it out. And so just like a lot of times, if you have a group of believers who are following a man, or in this case 12 people, or a church organization, and you give them sound doctrine, uh, immediately their immediate reaction is to reject it. Because most people are following man because they don't want to be persecuted in the flesh. So they're not really under 100% grace. They're following law. They're following the flesh. They're following a man. So you've got the 12 apostles here, and they don't believe that, that uh, Paul is saved, even saved. But Barnabas, for whatever reason, does. He, he looks at it, and he's able to have the Holy Ghost within him overcome his flesh and say, I see the difference. I see what he's given. He's given this new gospel, a new sound doctrine. It fits along. He's probably, I mean, if he spent three years at Jesus, you know Barnabas is asking him questions and saying, and he's probably giving him scripture to show this is a mystery. It was kept secret. But now, you know, look at the verses. Look at the stories in heaven in Amos. Look at Job 15, 15, that the heavens are unclean in his sight. Look at the covenant in Genesis 15, justified, Abraham justified by faith alone. And then Genesis uh, 22, justified by faith plus works. Read the book of James. That's already out by now. You can see it was faith plus works there with Genesis 22, but Genesis 15, it was faith alone. Abraham was justified two different ways. Guess what? I, Paul, justified two ways. I was justified by faith plus works under Ananias in Acts 9, 16, and 17. And then in Acts 9, 23, Jesus revealed to me a new gospel, faith, uh, grace alone, just like Paul, uh, J, uh, Abraham was justified by faith alone in Genesis 15. And so just like Abraham justified under both programs and his program was Israel's, then my, I am also justified two ways and my program is the dispensation of grace. Uh, and so he goes over this stuff. You could see from the Old Testament with the Holy Ghost revealing it to you. Now that you're in this point of Acts 9, then Paul could give the three years of training, condense it down basically to tell them about the mystery gospel, the mystery doctrine, and they could see it. But the point is they have to have the heart to see it. They have to have that desire. Uh, and so they... Um, and so they finally, they, they do, Barnabas believes. The other apostles won't see him, Acts 9, 27, except for Peter and James the Lord's brother. Apparently, James the Lord's brother says, Paul's crazy, I'm not going to believe him. And so you notice who's in unbelief, basically, at this point. Um, not recognizing... Not recognizing uh, mystery. I'm trying to condense it here. Uh, you've got J. You've got the eleven apostles. James, the Lord's brother. And probably others as well. But it's mainly those top guys. You know, if you give, let's say you've got a doctrine of... Um, Water baptism, not for today, right? This is what today's Judaizers say. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, plus water baptism is how you're saved. And you learn, oh, it's not water baptism today, or, or if it's not how you're saved, it's uh, an outward manifestation of an inward work of grace. But you learn from Paul that 
There's only one baptism today, Ephesians 4, 5. That's the baptism into Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, Romans 6, 3, and 4, done by the Holy Ghost, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. And uh, that accomplishes spiritual circumcision. Um, so you're identified with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, which accomplishes spiritual circumcision, which gives you eternal security, Colossians 2, 10 through, down through 15, let's say. Uh, so you learn that in Paul's epistles. Uh, you learn water baptism, not for today, not for salvation, not for an outward manifestation of an inward work of grace. And so uh, you go ahead and you, and you preach that. Uh, but you're in a group of Baptists. Well, the Baptists aren't going to believe you, but maybe a couple of them do because they know you're a student of God's Word and they're willing to listen to the verses and everything. And so maybe you do get a couple that will believe. But who won't believe for sure? Well, I shouldn't say for sure, because God's grace can overcome everything. But the most unlikely person in the Baptist church to believe Paul's message and to reject water baptism is the pastor of the church. Because he's got a salary, and even if he doesn't, he's got a lot of years of indoctrination from the Baptist cemetery school. Uh, he's been preaching it. So even if he doesn't get a salary, uh, He's, you know, you could be a closet right divider uh, in a Baptist church, but the Baptist preacher, probably not. And so then if he preaches the mystery, he's going to be kicked out, probably. I mean, there's a chance that the church will follow him because maybe they're just following man, and so they'll just believe whatever he says. And there are cases where Baptist churches are converted to right division churches. But for the most part, you're going to have to give up your livelihood. You're going to have to give up your church. And so the leaders are less likely to believe. So you want to convince a right divider about doctrine that goes against their tradition? Chances are they're not going to do that. Uh, but the ones who are more likely are the ones who are new or uh, you know, students of God's Word. The, the pastors, the higher-ups, they're not going to believe it because... They've got their whole reputation and their whole ministry. It would affect their ministry, uh, and so they won't believe it. Uh, you know, chances are, chances are that's how it is. So uh, when Barnabas takes Saul to the apostles, you have out of the twelve, only Peter believes. You see that finally, um, it says in verse 28, Acts 9, 28, he was with them coming in and going out of Jerusalem. So it appears from Acts 9.28 that you have the, uh, we're going to just say Jewish uh, Israel. We'll call it Jewish believers in Israel. Jewish believers in Israel's program are uh, believe Paul. Not the higher ups, not the 11 apostles or other like James the Lord's brother, but the higher-ups believe. And then in Acts 9.29, it says, He spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. And we mentioned last time that those Grecians there would be the Gentile believers in Israel's program. Gentile believers in Israel's program do not believe Paul. And we talked last time about why that is. Because they have been circumcised. They're following the Mosaic Law. And now you're telling them that, oh, if you'd have just waited six months until the dispensation of grace started, then you wouldn't have been circumcised. You wouldn't have had to follow the Mosaic Law. And now what God is doing, He's going to rapture up believers in the body of Christ before He's going to give eternal life to believers in Israel's program in the kingdom. And they're not even Israel before. Now they, they converted. With the, they became proselytes. And so they, uh, they're they really against Paul. Those end up being then the Judaizers. You see there in verse 29, He spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. They were in Jerusalem. These are Jewish believers in Israel's program in Jerusalem. But they're so against him you, know, you don't have James the Lord's brother or the 11 apostles trying to slay Paul. But you've got Jewish, uh, Gentile believers in Israel's program. They try to kill Paul. And these people here are the Judaizers. 
of Acts 15. Probably. They are the Judaizers of Acts 15 because uh, they're the ones then continue over a 14-year period to come up with this, if you're not circumcised according to the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. And so what they do is, because they're trying to kill Paul, then that creates a, an issue. So now Paul, he came up to preach the mystery gospel to Jew, Jews so that they may be saved, unbelieving Jews so that they may be saved because his heart's desire, Romans 9, 3 and 4 and Romans 10, 1, is for Israel to, to be saved under that mystery program. And so he's gone up to preach to them, but because of, and he's going with the Jewish believers in Israel, they believe Paul, so he's able to do some things there, but the Gentile believers in Israel's program, not only do they not believe Paul, they want to kill Paul, desire to kill Paul, and eventually they're the ones who end up with this death, burial, and resurrection plus circumcision to be saved. They mix works and grace, and what do you see in the Protestant Reformation. You see people coming out by grace alone, but yet you have people that were within that church before called the Jesuits, and they add laws, and they infiltrate all the denominations. So there isn't a denomination out there that will teach Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection alone as atonement for your sins. But And it's because the Judaizers of today, i.e. the Jesuits, the Roman Catholics, have infiltrated all these denominations and have corrupted the gospel there. So that's today's Judaizers. <clears throat> and so we'll say, we'll put in parentheses here, Jesuits would be an example of them. Okay, maybe I shouldn't have done that because now it's in my way of what I want to write over here. So let's uh, put this underneath and then I'll write my little map over here that we wrote uh, last week. So Paul give you an idea of where everything is here. So we're going to have at the bottom here, we've got Jerusalem down here. And of course, Israel, the northern part is up here. You've got uh, Damascus is up here. You've got uh, Syria up here. Then over here on this side is water. Water over here. Water. And then it comes around over here. And this is where uh, Cilicia is. Cilicia, which also the capital of Cilicia is Tarsus. And that's where Paul is from. So you see in Acts 9.30, which when the brethren knew. So when these Jewish believers in Israel knew that the Gentiles believers in Israel are trying to kill Paul. Which end up being the Judaizers that you got to deal with in Acts 15, 14 years later. I mean, this stuff takes time sometimes, you know. They build within and then uh, cause this problem. So then, Acts 9.30, when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. So he was in Jerusalem teaching uh, mystery gospel to get Israel saved. But now he can't stay in Israel because of the Judaizers wanting to kill him. He can't go to Damascus because that's where he first started preaching the mystery gospel in Acts 9.23, and they also want to kill him there. So the people in Damascus want to kill him, the people in Jerusalem want to kill him, and so then they, uh, it says they brought him to, they sent to Caesarea, they brought him forth to Tarsus, they sent him forth to Tarsus. Basically, go back to your hometown and start from there. And you'll see in Galatians 1, he says, in Galatians 1.21, that he came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. So he can't go here. Basically, this here, this area here, wants to kill Paul. This way down, they want to kill Paul. So he can't preach in this area. But he, So he gets on a boat in Caesarea, and he's going up to Tarsus, but he goes ahead and stops in Syria because he says, well... Maybe I can get those people saved. And then he goes back to Cilicia, to Tarsus. And then he says in verse 22, Galatians 1.22, He was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. 
he got to teach to some of them in Jerusalem, uh, but that was the unbelievers. You have in this region here, you've got a, you, you know, in this part here, because of what had been going on in this area here, this is the Jewish area, Israel and Jerusalem. And in that area, and maybe we'll write it, uh, let me just let me just start over up here. Okay. So in what you've got in Israel is you've got uh, we're just called apostate. Israel, or apostate, we won't call them churches, we'll call them synagogues, because that's the term for the Jewish synagogues. you got apostate synagogues, and then you've got uh, churches of believing Israel. Paul went to the apostate synagogues in Jerusalem, but now the Judaizers, the Gentile believers in Israel's program, want to kill Paul. So then he goes up to Syria and then into Cilicia. Paul wanted to get the Jews saved in the new program. But the, and the churches here of believing Israel, now he got to reach Jerusalem, but he didn't get farther than Jerusalem because of the Judaizers. So that's why he says in Galatians 1 and 22, and I didn't keep my place over there, Galatians 1.22, was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea which were in Christ. So you see there the, the distinction in Christ. So churches of believing Israel would be what he's referencing in Galatians 1.22 because they are in Christ. Not to say they're in the body of Christ, but people who are part of the bride of Christ believe in Israel. The bride is one with the, the bridegroom just like the body of the bridegroom is one with the head of the bridegroom. So all both believing Israel and the body of Christ were both in Christ, just in different ways, in different programs, just like your, my body is in, my, in me differently than my wife's body was in me in marriage. Um, so too, believing Israel is the bride of Christ, believing Gentiles here or the ones saved in Paul's program would be uh, the body of Christ. When I say believing Gentiles, I'm referring to uh, the body of Christ, which could have included uh, Jew, physical Jews as well. But spiritually, they are called Gentiles. So he is unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed, and they glorified God in me. So in Galatians 1, 22 through 24, the, these churches here heard of the new dispensation and it says they glorified God in me. Glorified God in Paul. Uh, again, you see there in verse 23 that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed, don't think he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He's already established he's got a different gospel. The faith means trusting and having faith in what God has told you. Jesus said in John 6, 63, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So, Jesus' words to you, and let's write that in capitals to, so you see that for emphasis, Jesus' words to you are life, and they are spirit. So if the, if the gospel of the kingdom is preached when you get to Paul's gospel, that's not life. Because the, the gospel for today is Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin. The gospel of the kingdom was... Recognize your sin, trust in God to save you, confess your sin, put yourself under the Mosaic Law, get water baptized. And so uh, those would be words of life to them. 
So it's not that these, uh, so when it says there that he preacheth the faith, which once he destroyed, it is just believe in the gospel. So the people, the churches of believing Israel here, they have the faith of Christ by believing the gospel of the kingdom. When Paul preaches to unbelievers, he is preaching Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin. And when they believe that, they are also in the faith. They, are, they have the faith of Christ. It's just the new dispensation, they're in the body of Christ, and the old dispensation, they're in the bride of Christ. But both the bride and the body are one with Christ, and so they're both in Christ. But how is it then, in Galatians 1, 22 through 24, that they heard, these churches in Judea heard, they heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. Well, the way he did that is because of down here. He said that I abode with Peter 15 days. James, the Lord's brother, didn't believe. And the other apostles didn't believe. Only of the twelve, and basically of the leaders, because James, the Lord's brother, ends up being a leader. And we see in Acts 15, he has taken the leadership role over what Peter had, and we'll get to that someday. <laughs> uh, and so, what you've got here, the question is, since Paul was desiring to go to all of Israel with the mystery gospel, but he only got to Jerusalem, and he got to the believers there, and they believe Paul, so they understand the Jewish believers in Israel believe Paul. The Gentile believers don't. So what are you going to do? You've got to split there. Well, of the twelve, the ones with the most authority, again, they don't have that anymore. I mean, they do because they're still in Israel's program, but there's a new dispensation. But Peter would be the one that would be seen as uh, more believable by the churches that believe in Israel because they're still in Israel's program. And Peter was, at that time anyway, the leader there. And so it makes sense that since Peter believed, and nobody else did of the twelve, that Peter would spend 15 days with Paul to understand the mystery gospel and the doctrine associated with it. So he spends those uh, 15 days with, with uh, Peter. And uh, so then, when you see in Acts 9, going back to Acts 9 now, Lost my place over there. Acts 9, continuing that text over there, you see in verse 30 that they brought Paul. He takes a boat. He goes to Syria and then to Cilicia or Tarsus. And then it says in verse 31, Acts 9, 31, Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. So you've got here believers, believing churches of believing Israel. And in all of Israel, it's mentioned, because in Judea and Galilee and Samaria, that would be all 12 tribes, so that whole region there, uh, they have rest. They don't have the persecution anymore because, you know, there was a persecution in Acts 8 and verse 1, a uh, great persecution against the church. But they don't have that anymore. Because, they have it in Jerusalem, but that's it. Because of the dispensational change. Satan is now focusing the, the apostle of the Gentiles and the one called to get all unbelievers saved is, um, is Paul. So Satan is focusing on Paul. Now he still focuses on believing Israel because he doesn't want... Satan doesn't want to believe in Israel to come into the knowledge of the truth. So that's why there's still issues in Jerusalem. Because the leaders of Israel's program are in Jerusalem. But uh, So Peter, though, of the twelve, he's the only one, the only one of the leaders who understands and believes Paul. Now, Barnabas as well. Barnabas will go out with uh, Paul on his first apostolic journey in Acts chapter 13. But we've got Peter here. He believes that Paul is saved, he gets the mystery doctrine for 15 days. And so now since the churches have rest in all of Israel, Acts 9, 31, then what Peter does is he then goes in Acts 9, 32, uh, we're going to say Acts 9, 32 through 42. 
Acts 9, 32 through 42, Peter goes to uh, churches, goes to churches in believing Israel. And that is all of Israel, all of that whole region there, because they have rest there. And what he's doing is he's explaining the dispensational change. He explains the dispensational change to them. Not that they're under the new program. They're still under Israel's program. That's the promise that God gave to them. But they need to understand the dispensational change so that if people then, new people, want to be saved, then they have to... Uh, believe Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is atonement for their sin and not the old ways uh, of water, confess your sin, uh, recognize your sin, confess your sin, get water baptized. They have to believe in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection because as atonement for their sin because that's the change in program. So that's why in Acts 9.32 it says, in Acts 9.32, it came to pass as Peter passed throughout all quarters so that's Peter going to the churches and believing in Israel. And you see, it says he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydda. So he's not going to get people saved with the mystery gospel. I mean, he does. Paul understands it for three years. He understood it. Peter knows that God hasn't commissioned him to go to the Gentiles to be saved. That commission is to go goes to Paul, not to Peter. But Peter is in charge of the little flock to get them edified in doctrine. And even though the doctrine of Paul isn't applicable to them, it is still, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All of it is profitable. So now we've got some new scripture. It's not written down yet, but we've got new scripture from God through Paul, the mystery dispensation, and that's profitable to them. Just like for us, we don't just read Romans through Philemon. I mean, I'm covering, doing a Bible overview. I'm in Psalms right now in the uh, Monday night class. Tuesday night, we're in Luke, and in the car, I'm doing Psalms there. We're doing Scripture outside of Romans through Philemon because that's profitable to us. Well, the reverse is true for believing Israel. The new information is, uh, of the mystery dispensation is profitable to believe in Israel even though it's not directly applicable. All Scripture is for them, but not all Scripture is to them. And so he, Peter, of the twelve, is the only one. Again, you remember, people look at man. So if Barnabas does it, or if some other disciples, some of these Jewish believers, go to, throughout all Israel to the saints, the believers, the believing churches of believing Israel, and talk about that new dispensation, probably not going to believe it. But if you go to if Peter does it, since he was over the little flock, you see them in Acts 2, Acts 3, Acts 4, Acts 5, taking leadership positions, then if Peter does it, they're more likely to believe. And since he is the only one of the twelve who recognizes the dispensational change, then he's the one who goes out alone. This isn't the continuation of Peter's ministry to Israel. Uh, well, I mean, it is, but he's not trying to get people saved under Israel's program. He is going to believers to edify them to, so that they may understand the dispensational change that has occurred. So he goes down to the saints and dwelt at Lydda. Now verse 33, Acts 9, 33. There he found a certain man named uh, Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. What we're going to see is we're going to see two miracles, and these two miracles are going to be signs. Because remember, the Jews require a sign, and miracles still going on. So you've got signs given to believing Israel to show that the dispensational change is true. You know, think of Mark 16. Israel, the, the 12 are commissioned, or the 11 there, are commissioned um, to give the gospel of the kingdom, they preach it to Israel, and it says uh, in Mark 16, 20, they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with signs following. Confirming the word, confirm word 
with signs following. Because the Jews require a sign. 1 Corinthians 1.22 So when Peter goes to the churches of believing Israel to give them kingdom doctrine, uh, oh, not kingdom doctrine, he goes to kingdom believers to give them mystery gospel and mystery doctrine so that they understand a dispensational change has occurred. It's like we go over kingdom doctrine in Israel's program because it's profitable for us even though they're not Jesus' words to us. You've also got uh, Jesus' words to the body of Christ which would be profitable, not directly applicable, but profitable to the churches of believing Israel and Israel's program. And since Israel looks for the... God confirms the word with signs following in Israel's program, that's what he does with Peter here. So you've got Aeneas, so in Acts 9.33, you've got A-E-N-E-A-S. He's sick of the palsy for eight years. The number eight in your Bible signifies a new beginning. Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week. A week is seven. So once you get to seventh day, then you've got like today, Sunday, Sunday, May 26th, is a new beginning. We're beginning a new week. Uh, because the seven have passed away, now we've got an eighth day. Eighth day, starting a new week. So Aeneas here is sick of the palsy for eight years. So that eight signifies a new beginning. Is Israel is sick of the palsy spiritually condition, spiritually speaking. Uh, they can't walk. They can't walk in the good works which God has wants them to do because of their spiritual sickness, because they're unbelievers. And God says, I still want Israel to be saved, but just under the new program. And so the eight signifies a new beginning or a new dispensation. This is a signif signifying the mystery dispensation by the fact that he has been sick eight years of the palsy. Verse 34, Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise, make thy bed. And he arose immediately. Um, I don't know if, if God arose, if I was in the bed for eight years sick of the palsy and God had me arise, I probably wouldn't make my bed. I'd probably, you know, <laughs> I'd be so happy I'd be running a marathon, you know. <laughs> I would say, oh, let me make my bed. But I think what it's saying there, the significance is, make thy bed. In other words, you're not going to be laying in this bed all day and all night. God has healed you. So make it up. It's not going to be used for a while. That's the point. <laughs> not that he had to do that right away. Uh, Arise and make thy bed. Heroes immediately. So it's a sign of new life for Aeneas, eight years. Sign of new beginning. New dispensation. Mystery dispensation. So the mystery gospel, mystery doctrine given to these saints. Now, if they're believers, they're, uh, they're hearing of the new dispensation and they glorify God in what God is now doing in the new dispensation. But they're not part of the body of Christ. They're still part of the bride. They're still part of Israel's program because the contract God has made with them. But he's telling Peter, uh, is telling them, this is the new program. Paul is the new apostle. You are still going to have the same instructions, still have eternal life in God's kingdom on earth. But I'm going around to let you know. So if someone new comes in, you don't give them gospel of the kingdom. You give them the mystery gospel. Uh, um, you know, you'd say, well, you point them to Paul. Yeah, but where is Paul? I mean, they're down here in Israel. Paul can't go to Israel. Paul can't go to Damascus. It's not till 14 years later, according to Galatians 2, that he goes to Jerusalem. And that, in Galatians 2.2, 2, he went up by revelation. God says, okay, or Jesus Christ says, you need to go up to Jerusalem to take care of these Judaizers, which have uh, been building up their program for 14 years, and they're trying to mess up the grace of God by saying you've got to get under the law, you've got to get under circumcision. But he doesn't do go there for 14 years. So they're not going to, if you've got a new person, uh, come to your church and you're a part of believing Israel and you say, well, you're going to be a new uh, believer in a new program. You'll have eternal life, but you'll be in heaven. Trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is atonement for your sin. They're not going to say, go to Paul, because Paul's way up here. 
He can't be down here. They're going to try to kill him. He doesn't go back to Jerusalem for 14 years. So they're, uh, Paul is up here. So they're not going to say go to Paul. They're going to give him the mystery gospel. So they want people, God still wants Israel to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. It's just that Paul can't do it because these Judaizers are trying to kill him. And so Peter, though, is, believes after spending 15 days with Paul, so he's got a little bit of information, what the mystery gospel is, what the doctrine is, and he goes through all these churches here in Israel to give them, since they now have rest, so he gives them that doctrine so that they may um, understand the dispensational change, and when somebody new comes in, they can't just say, sorry, Israel's program is done, there's a new program. Oh, okay, how do I get saved? Uh, I don't know. Paul's doing it, but he's way up here, and he can't come down here because they'll kill him, so um, I guess he'll end up going to hell. Sorry about that. Bye-bye now. I mean, you, you don't do that. <laughs> you want them to be saved. So Peter's saying, I'm going to go to these churches, let them know the dispensational change, and then Jesus' words to them, the grace dispensation for those unbelievers, when they come to these Jewish churches, now they can get the mystery gospel and they can get sound doctrine in the mystery program. And it's, of course, it's going to be hard for them to believe that dispensational changes occurred. Since the Jews require a sign, the sign of Ananias, sick of the palsy, eight years, sign of a new beginning, mystery dispensation, he is healed. Verse 36 now, Acts 9, 36, there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom, when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. And forasmuch as Lydda was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. By the way, my uh, grandfather had different celebrities autograph. Uh, in his Bible at uh, their favorite scripture. Uh, that's where Pete Rose signed in his Bible. Uh, then Peter arose. <laughs> and Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, uh, they brought him into the upper chamber. And all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. I mean, you can understand. You know, the women's like, oh. She did such good work here. She made all these coats. I mean, we don't have any money. We sold all that we have. And uh, Dorcas gets clothes together. She makes these coats and she keeps us warm. Who's going to make our clothing? Who's going to keep us warm? And you know how women are. They get cold easier than men usually. Uh, they're saying, I'm going to get cold. And Dorcas helped me out. But now uh, who's going to sew these coats together? So do something, Peter. <laughs> so verse 40 Peter put them all forth, said, now calm down, calm down, go out here, let's, uh, let's see what the Lord will do. Peter put them all forth, kneeled down and prayed, and turning to him, turning him to the body, said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she said, up. And he gave her his hand, and lift her up, and when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. Again, it's the saints there. He's going to believers, churches of believing Israel there. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. There's the idea. Jew require a sign. Here's the sign. What's the sign? It's resurrection. Why? So Acts 9, 37 through 42, Tabitha, or Dorcas, resurrected. Resurrection shows new life, new beginning. Spiritually speaking, they were dead. Israel, dead in their trespasses and sins. But if they trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for their sin, they'll be alive as part of the body of Christ. Again, the believers there are still part of Israel's program. But new believers in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection are part of the new dispensation, which started with Paul in Acts 9.23. So it's a signifying, you've got the sickness of Ananias, the palsy, spiritually speaking, Israel is sick. Then you've got the resurrection of Tabitha. Uh, what are the signs of the kingdom? It's, uh, you know, the miracles that Jesus did. Resurrection, he did healings. It's to show that God has the ability to give you eternal life and to forgive you of your sins and to get rid of your spiritual sickness. And so now you have those miracles done, two miracles here, 
and the new dispensation so that believing Israel here, the churches of believing Israel, will see these signs and um, recognize the dispensational change. Remember Mark 16, 20, that since the Jews require a sign, uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 22, they require a sign, Jews need a sign. Then the sign uh, works with the word to confirm the word is true. So you got believers, that's how they were saved. They saw the signs. They believe they're part of believing Israel. Now Peter comes along, the leader of Israel's program, and gives them signs of sick of the palsy healed, Tabitha resurrected. Those are the signs that follow to show that a new dispensation has occurred. So now the churches of believing Israel will understand so that when people come to get saved, they'll get the mystery gospel rather than the, uh, the gospel of the kingdom. And you see there in uh, verse 42 that many believed in the Lord uh, when this happened. So uh, you saw in verse 35 also all that dwelt at Lydda and Saren saw him and turned to the Lord. So you see believers, new believers in, now in the body of Christ, but they're part of the churches of believing Israel but they're going to, of course, separate because they're going to get mystery doctrine and mystery, um, you know, to go along because they have different doctrine than what Israel has. And that's why you have Paul later on writing Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. He's writing, and of course, he wrote other letters that we don't have. He wrote to these churches, these new churches that were established out of believing Israel, in a lot of cases, especially in Israel, and they start their own church, like, the Corinthians, they started, they just went next door to the house of justice and started a church there. Uh, so that's what you have them doing. They're going and starting, uh, they're coming out of there but they, because they have a different gospel and different instructions for them. They're part of a different dispensation. But what Peter is doing is he's going throughout all of Israel since Paul couldn't do it, since they want to kill Paul. He had to get out of there, and he's up here in Syria and Cilicia. So now, Peter then is going throughout all of Israel, giving them the mystery gospel, and they're, and they're saved, and confirming the word with the signs following. Aeneas healed of the palsy eight years, sign of a new beginning. Tabitha resurrected, sign of a new beginning for Israel. Uh, you might want to write by that verse there with Tabitha uh, being resurrected. You might want to write Acts 7 and verse 60. Acts 7, verse 60, where the Holy Ghost through Stephen says, Lord, lay not this into their charge. It's the opportunity under the new dispensation for Israel to be saved in the body of Christ. And Tabitha being resurrected is a sign of that, as well as Aeneas uh, being raised from the, being sick of the palsy. So what that does is, now that takes care of Israel, uh, Israel and those Jews there so they know how they're saved in the mystery dispensation. So then what happens next is Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Oh, before I go into that, I also wanted to mention Acts 9.43. Um, Acts 9.43. Uh, let's, uh, well, let's just go ahead and start down here. keep these notes in order. Sometimes I probably confuse people if I just say, well, let me erase this part and then I put new notes. Well, those notes belong down here. So. <laughs> in Acts 9.43, I wanted you to note, and, and it's mentioned for you three times to show you how important it is. Acts 9.43, Acts 10.6, and Acts 10.32. Acts 9.43, and it came to pass that he tarried, P Peter tarried, many days in Joppa with one Simon a tanner. And uh, Acts 10 verse 6, he lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. And then verse 32, Acts 10 32, uh, send therefore to Joppa and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon a tanner by the seaside. And I, so it's mentioned three times. And when God mentions something once, it's important. If he mentions it more than once, pay attention. So, pay attention to this one. Uh, he says it three times. 
Simon a Tanner, Simon a Tanner, Simon a Tanner. And what's significant about that, why I mentioned it, is uh, Leviticus 11.8. And let's look at that. Leviticus, so here you've got Peter lodges with a Tanner. Now a Tanner is someone who uh, made, let's see, let's put what a Tanner is here. Tanner. Well, you may think of somebody that's going to go to Planet Fitness and get at a tanning bed or someone who's going to lie at the beach down here, which this is Memorial Day weekend. I bet it's packed down there. Uh, I'm not nearing anywhere that beach. There are a bunch of tanners out there on that beach. Well, it's in the morning, maybe not in the morning, but later on they'll be out there trying to get their tan. That's not what he is. He's not somebody who just really likes to get a tan. You know, he had his own tanning bed. And Peter's like, all right, own tanning bed. I'm staying with you. you know, <laughs> that's not what it is. Uh, a tanner is someone who uh, he made leather. He made leather out of dead animals. That's a tanner. Okay, why is that important? Leviticus 11 and verse 8. Well, the reason he probably stays with him, he's by the seaside and Peter's a fisherman so he can get food out of there. That's one reason. Uh, but how many people can you stay with? I mean, because here's the issue, and we'll probably get into this next week, is that when not only did James, the Lord's brother, not believe Paul, but he joined those Judaizers, it appears. And because Peter believes Paul and the other apostles don't believe Paul, Peter is ostracized from the rest of the apostles. Because in Acts 15, it is James, you've got at the Jerusalem Council, which we'll go over when we get to Galatians 2. In the Jerusalem Council, uh, here's James, and he says in Acts 15, 19, and I'll go ahead and write that on there. Acts 15, 19, James, this is what he says, Wherefore my sentence is my sentence is. In other words, this is what I have decided that we are going to do. If Peter is still the leader of the little flock in the eyes of Jerusalem, then James wouldn't say this. Peter speaks in Acts 15 and they listen to him. But James says, my sentence is. In other words, he, this equals James, the, the Lord's brother, the new leader of the twelve. James replaces, James the Lord's brother, James replaces Peter as the leader, as far as they're concerned. But as far as God is concerned, God still likes Peter, because Peter is the only one, when God made the dispensational change, Peter is the only one that believed. And you can see that with Peter, how he would do that. You know, he's the guy of the 12. Hey, bid me to come out there. Jesus, you're walking on water? That's pretty cool. Bid me to come out there and walk on the water. Okay, Peter, come. He gets out of the boat. He starts walking. People criticize Peter. Oh, he should have had the faith. Then he wouldn't have sunk. True. And Jesus does say that. But Peter got out of the boat. He walked on the water. You know, I've been to, on hikes, there's a place called Angel's Rest that is in Zion. And it's like you're just walking on, you're walking on the side of a rock holding to a chain. Um, I did it, and I think I'm very stupid for doing it. I survived it. But now, there's no way I'm doing it. <laughs> and there are people, um, I went back again last year, and uh, I got to the point where they, where they do that, and I stopped. But I'm looking up there. And I'm seeing these people on this rock holding on to the chain. If the chain breaks, they, they fall, maybe die, certainly seriously injured, if not dead. Um, if that chain breaks or if they lose their grip, they, you know, they're not holding on some pulley system. They're holding on with their hands. If they lose their grip, they're gone. And I'm looking at that and say, okay, I see them doing that, but there's no way you're getting me up there to do that. Half dome at Yosemite. I saw the people holding on those cables going to the top. There's no way I'm doing it. I know. I see 100 people just did it and they were fine. I'm not doing that. Peter, 
sees Jesus walking on water. The twelve see it too. Peter says, let me do it. Okay, come on out. He does it. Now, of course, he, he starts to sink because, oh, 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 no, no. And then he starts to, because he loses faith in that and Jesus uh, criticizes him. But the point is, he had more faith than the other 11. He got out of the boat. He walked on the water. <laughs> and so Peter is, of the 11, he's the only one. He says, okay, Jesus is given the mystery gospel, new dispensation, new instructions, and he's given it to this guy who was groomed to be the Antichrist, who persecuted the church uh, more, than any, uh, more than anybody else. Uh, I'm on board with that. <laughs> the other 11 say, good luck, Peter, see you later. And then James says, they say, well, James, you met with him. Uh, what do you think? I think Peter's crazy. I think he's an unbeliever. He's going away from the truth. I mean, look at that. Look at what he's doing. He's lodging with a tanner. Tanner makes leather out of dead animals. And what does Leviticus 11 verse 8 say about that? Leviticus 11 and verse 8. The Mosaic law. Remember, they're under the law. Leviticus 11 verse 8. Uh, talking about... Um, Unclean. Now, this is only unclean animals. Uh, let's start in verse uh, 7. The swine, Leviticus 11, 7. The swine, though he divide the hoof and be cloven-footed, yet he cheweth not the cud, he is unclean to you. Of their flesh ye shall not eat, and their carcass shall ye not touch. They are unclean to you. Now, you read verse 9. These shall ye eat of all that are in the waters, whatsoever hath fins and scales in the waters and the seas and the rivers, uh, that shall you eat, and all that have not fins nor scales in the seas and the rivers of all that move in the waters and of any living thing which is in the waters, they shall be an abomination unto you. They shall be even an abomination unto you. You shall not eat of their flesh, but you shall have their carcasses in abomination. So you've got some fish that are clean, some are not. You've got some animals that are clean, some are not. And if you touch, uh, do not touch, dead carcass of unclean animals. Now, Peter probably still obeyed this rule as we're going to see in Acts 10 next here. Oh, probably not going to get through Acts 10 tonight. today. Now, I'm going to get through it. We're going to get through it. Um, so he probably still obeys this rule. But what is James the Lord's brother saying? Peter has denied the faith. He isn't believing what God revealed to him. God, Jesus called him to be the leader here. He's been the leader, Acts 2, Acts 3, Acts 4, Acts 5. And now he's gone apostate. He's following this Paul. You know, the 11 apostles, they don't believe. James the Lord's brother saw Paul along with Peter. Peter believed James did it. James goes back. And he says, look at what Peter is doing. He's staying with a tanner who makes leather out of dead animals. You know some of those animals are unclean. And you know what Leviticus 11.8 says, you can't touch the dead carcass of unclean animals. Peter has denied the faith. He's denied the Mosaic law. He's going around, along with some guy who uh, was being groomed to be the Antichrist, persecuted the church. He's being set up and he is going to just go right along. He's now apostate. We don't have anything to do with Peter anymore. And so James then becomes the new leader of the twelve. Now, 14 years later, they understand that Peter really was an apostate and they see what has happened with these uh, the new dispensation and it really is Jesus Christ starting something new and all these people being saved. So they understand it by Acts 15. But in Acts 9, they're thinking Peter is apostate. I mean, what happens... With people, you're in the Baptist church, you leave, and you go to be part of a uh, right division church. Uh, backslidden, backslidden, he ne or never was saved. You know, that's what people think. Um, but if they see you after a while, and they say, wow, I still see Christ in you. I still see the doctrine in you. I know you're not part of us, but that new church, it must be something to that anyway. Um, that's how they handle Peter. Peter tarries many days in Joppa with one Simon of Tanner. But James, the Lord's brother, is probably out there saying, he's apostate. Look at what he's doing. 
you got to believe he's touching the dead. First, he goes along with the guy who persecuted us, Saul. Now he's probably touching dead carcasses of unclean animals because he's staying with this tanner who makes leather out of dead animals. So he's disobeying the Mosaic law. Uh, that's what they're probably thinking. Okay. <sighs> Hour and 20 minutes. Okay. We're just going to get through Acts 10. We need to do this because we're in Galatians. We're not in Acts. So, Acts 10, verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. So, Acts 10, 1. I'll start back up here. Okay, Acts 10, 1. We've got uh, Cornelius, who is a Gentile. Verse 2, a devout man, one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people, prayed to God always. So, uh, Acts 10, 2. Cornelius blesses Israel. But apparently he's not saved. He never became a Gentile proselyte. And the salvation under Israel's program doesn't happen for the Gentiles until after Jesus, until Jesus comes back. So um, he's blessing Israel. So, you know, if Jesus did come back right then, then he would be in the kingdom as a Gentile who blessed Israel. But he hasn't actually believed the gospel. And, uh, well, I mean, he's believed that part. But, I mean, he didn't become a proselyte. He didn't become circumcised. So he's not... A proselyte Jew like, like we mentioned the ones in Acts 9.29, those Grecians. So, uh, verse 3 now, Peter saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying to him, Cornelius, I'm sorry, this is what uh, Cornelius sees. Verse 4, when he looked on him, he was afraid, said, What is it, Lord? He said unto him, Thy prayers and thy alms are come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. So uh, he lodgeth with one Simon a tanner. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. So basically the Lord says, Cornelius, I see you seeking me, and I reward those who diligently seek me. Therefore, uh, you are going to have life. I'm going to give you life. Uh, very similar to what Paul, you don't have the bright light there. Uh, but it's a vision, and uh, the Lord comes to him in a vision. Uh, Paul is on the road to Damascus, and Jesus spoke to him there. Anyway, so then um, he sends, the angel spake. Verse 7, Cornelius departed, sent two servants. And now Peter, he rises up uh, the next day, and verse 10, he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. Acts 10, 11, and saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherewith, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord. Uh, you know, you think Peter would have learned from Matthew 16 when Jesus said he was going to die, be buried and rise from the dead. He said, Not so, Lord, this shall never happen unto you. Uh, Peter again goes against what the Lord tells him here. Now, so Lord, it shows you how hard traditions die hard. Uh, <laughs> he says, Not so Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean. Okay. Then, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. So, let's look at that now. Acts 10, and starting with verse uh, 9, and down to verse 17. Uh, vision of unclean meat. Peter says, uh, I can't eat. Why? It's against the Mosaic law. Peter is still, I know he recognizes the dispensational change, but Peter is not part of the body of Christ. 
He's part of Israel's program, and as such, he is required to obey the Mosaic law. Can't eat per Mosaic law. Uh, and so, it happens three times. Well, then he asks, Peter wonders what this means. Peter knows he can't eat that meat because Jesus told him in Matthew 23, verses 2 and 3, Jesus told him in Matthew 23 and verse 2, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. So he knows the Mosaic law is what he's supposed to obey. Obey, they sit in Moses' seat, obey the Mosaic law. He has to obey the Mosaic law according to Matthew 23. We can get rid of this chart over here. According to Matthew 23, verses 2 through 3. He has to obey the Mosaic law. So he knows that that vision, when he says, arise and eat, and he gets it three times, he knows it can't mean, I'm go out and eat this pig. He knows that's not true because Jesus commanded him to obey the Mosaic law. And he even told them in Matthew in chapter 5, Matthew 5 and verse uh, 18, Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Matthew 5, 18 tells Peter will be under Mosaic law until all be fulfilled, till, till the kingdom come, thy kingdom come. So until God's kingdom comes on earth, Peter is under the Mosaic law. So Peter knows when he sees the vision three times and he's told to arise and eat unclean meat. He knows that doesn't mean go out and eat a pig because that would be against the Mosaic law. And he is, Jesus told him that he is under that Mosaic law till the kingdom comes. So he knows that's not what it means. And so he wonders about it. He saw it three times and he wonders. And I guess finally uh, God gave him the, Jesus gave him the revelation of what it means because if you go down to verse 28, Acts 10, 28, Peter said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So he learns from Acts 10, 28, not that the meat is clean for Peter to eat because he's under them, always under that Mosaic law. Peter learns... Peter learns Gentiles are clean under new dispensation. That's the important thing because he's already seen at the in the end of Acts 9, we saw he went to Israel, he went to believers there, and he told them about the new gospel so that if new people came in, they would give them the mystery gospel rather than the gospel of the kingdom. So he's already told them that. But now what he's learning is the gospel, and I'm sure Paul told him that the middle wall partition is down, but remember he only spent 15 days with Paul. And he spent, Peter spent his whole life under that Mosaic law and the middle wall partition being up. And so it takes a while, but Peter says, I finally get, now I understand. When I saw that vision three times of the unclean meat, I know God wasn't telling me to eat a pig because Jesus already told me I'm under the Mosaic law till the kingdom comes. Under that Mosaic law, Matthew 23, 2 and 3, Matthew 5, 18. So it can't be that. It must be God telling me, Jesus telling me, that the Gentiles are now clean because Paul told me about that, but that was all 15 days is a lot of information. I don't, yeah, I, now I understand. Paul told me, and again, you see the, how it operates once a new dispensation has come. You don't have the Holy Ghost telling Peter, um, meat 
uh, means Gentiles are uh, clean and now they can get the gospel and they don't have to go through the Jews and the middle wall partition is down. You don't have the Holy Ghost communicating that. Peter has to think it through. Okay, I heard that doctrine from Paul. Okay, I saw the vision of the meat, she to meet three times. And God told me that now something is clean. And I know it can't be the meat, so what is it? And finally he figures it out in verse 28. Peter learns that the Gentiles are clean. Not the meat, can't go out and eat a pig. But the Gentiles are clean under the new dispensation. So now... Now what Peter does is he already went to believing Israel in the end of Acts 9 and told them. Now what he's doing is Jesus sends him to Gentiles so that they may be saved under the new dispensation. And he's going to see that the gospel of the mystery gospel has changed. So that's what we're going to get to now. And then once I finish, once I talk about that, we'll close. Because that's all we need here. That's all we need to understand. First, let's look at Acts 2. And verse 38. And um, so under Israel's program, under Israel's program, Acts 2.38 says, Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So Israel's program, Israel's program, Acts 2.38 is... Uh, repent, change your mind. Then be water baptized. And then you receive the Holy Ghost. You receive Holy Ghost. How? How do you get the Holy Ghost? Well, the water baptism is part of it. you got to have the laying on of hands to separate yourself from apostate Israel, to be considered to be a part of believing Israel. Um, Acts 8, Acts 8, still part of the uh, Israel's program here, Acts 8, verse uh, 14. When the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was not fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then lay they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Acts 8, 14 through 17. Apostles, you notice it's Peter and John. Apostles lay hands on believers to receive Holy Ghost. They're already believers. They've already been baptized. Acts 8, 16. But they don't have the Holy Ghost until the apostles lay the hands on them. They have to lay the hands on believers to receive the Holy Ghost. Same thing with Paul when he was saved in Acts 9 under the kingdom program. Um, God sends Ananias to Paul. Uh, apparently none of the twelve apostles would believe uh, that he was a, a saved man. Ananias would. And so he says in verse 17, Acts 9, 17, Brother Saul, he's already a believer. The Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Saul believed. Ananias laid hands on him. To receive the Holy Ghost. Acts 18. Acts 18. Acts 19. Acts 19. Paul lays hands upon believers who are believed under the John the Baptist, but they weren't there on the day of Pentecost. And uh, they're baptized. Uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, they had already been baptized. Verse 6, Acts 19, 6. When Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. So Acts 19, 6. Another example. Uh, Holy Ghost received by laying on of hands by apostles. In this case, Paul. Uh, and he can do it since he's a saved member of the gospel of the kingdom as well as the mystery gospel. 
Okay, um, let's finish here. So with Cornelius, Peter is talking and talks about what happened to him and everything. And then in verse 34, Acts 10, 34, Acts 10, 34, Peter opened his mouth, said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. That's what he learned with the sheet of meat. He said that in Acts 10, 28. Basically, he understands Ephesians 2, 14. The middle wall partition is down, Ephesians 2, 14. And you could also say Acts 10, whatever verse I just read. 34. God is no respecter of persons, Acts 10, 34. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Um, let's go down to verse 38, Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. So Acts 10, 39 and 40, Peter says, Peter preaches, and this is our title, Peter Preaches Mystery Gospel. Peter preaches Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. He preached that Jesus slew and hang on a tree. Him God raised up the third day, so he was buried, and then he rose from the dead the third day. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Verse 41, Now to all the people, but not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead, sitting at the right hand of the Father. Verse 43, To him give all the prophets witness, and through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Believe in him... For forgiveness, we'll say. For forgiveness of sins. Remission of sins. What do you believe? Well, we were just told. He just told them the two verses. That's not verse 41, is it? Verse 43. Well, he just told them in verses 39 and 40, he preached Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Now verse 43 he says, those that believe in him shall have remission of sins. Verse 44, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word. Heard meaning they believed. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Holy Ghost falls on believers. That right there tells you a dispensational change has occurred. Because... Acts 2.38 Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. How? By apostles laying hands on believers to receive the Holy Ghost. Acts 8 You had people who were repented and were water baptized but they didn't receive the Holy Ghost until the apostles laid hands on them. Saul He believed he didn't have the Holy Ghost until Ananias laid hands on him. The people in Acts 19, they were baptized with the baptism of John. They repented and were water baptized back there in Matthew 3 somewhere. But they don't have the Holy Ghost. Paul lays his hands on them. They receive the Holy Ghost. In Israel's program, after the Holy Ghost comes, if you are not there at the day of Pentecost, if you believe the gospel of the kingdom and are water baptized, you also have to have apostles lay their hands on you in order to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Because they had the power to remit or to retain sins, John 20. Uh, and so, and because God is the one who supernaturally tells them, okay, that person has believed or they haven't really believed. They're just saying it, but they haven't. So um, they have the power to remit or to retain sins. And so if they lay their hands on somebody, they're remitting the sin and now the Holy Ghost can come. If they don't lay their hands on them, they believe their sins aren't remitted. Because it's the apostles who say retain or remit sins. 
But here in Acts 10, here's Peter. He preaches Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And you believe in him for forgiveness. Boom! Holy Ghost comes. Peter has not laid his hands on them. They have not been water baptized. In fact, you see there, uh, verse 44, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Verse 45, the Jewish people were amazed, were astonished actually that that came. The Gentiles got the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, verse 46, how did they know they had the Holy Ghost? They spake with tongues and magnified God. Holy Ghost falls on believers. They speak in tongues, in new tongues. So the Jewish believers are astonished. Verse 45, they're astonished. Why? Because they know what you got to do. You repent. Your water baptized. Apostle lays the hands on them. Their sins are remitted. They receive the Holy Ghost. That's not what happened. Here, nobody's been water baptized. Nobody's laid their hands on anybody. And they're already speaking in tongues. All they did was trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for their sin. That right there is Peter preaches mystery gospel right there. And people will say, oh, well, this happened beforehand. No way that it happened beforehand. Oh, well, they because the formula, repent, be water baptized, apostles lay your hands on you, you get the Holy Ghost. And here, that doesn't happen. It's they trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for their sin, prophesied in Acts 39 and 40. He says in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Then it talks in verse 43 about believing on him for forgiveness. So they trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection in verses 39 and 40. They trust in that as atonement for their sin in verse 43. And the Holy Ghost falls on them and they speak in tongues. And then it says... Verse 47, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, then prayed they him to tarry uh, certain days. So, uh, 1047, Acts 1047, they are water baptized. I don't know if that's on the screen or not, but there it is, water baptized. So it is clear in Acts 10 that Cornelius and those with him are members of the body of Christ. Because they are saved by trusting in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. They receive the Holy Ghost. They receive forgiveness of sins. The apostles don't have to lay their hands on them. And they don't have to be water baptized. And so now Peter, what he has learned, what Peter learned in the end of Acts 9, is that, uh, that now the, the new mystery gospel and the new mystery doctrine is for Israel. And then he learns in Acts 10, it's also for the Gentiles. So he's learned the mystery gospel. He's learned that doctrine. It's been confirmed with signs following that that is true uh, under Peter there. And now in Acts 10, it shows that now uh, the Gentiles do not have to go through Israel to be saved. Um, they can just believe Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for their sin. Boom, they got the Holy Ghost right then. Now they're water baptized because they're you know, because of what Peter does and also, you know, so as not to defend the Jews and all that, but uh, because they're people that Paul water baptized as well. But the point is, they're saved by the mystery gospel. Okay, so um, we're out of, we're way over, uh, <laughs> about 15 minutes. But um, I wanted to finish that section. We're done with Galatians 1. And so next time what we'll do is we'll start in Galatians 2, which talks about the Jerusalem Council. And we'll look in Acts 15 for the Jerusalem Council and see what happens there. Uh, so let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this new dispensation. That we don't have to go through a mediator of Levitical priest and be circumcised and do the sacrifices. We thank you that Jesus Christ is our mediator. We thank you that you've made us, you've reconciled us to God already. We've already received forgiveness of sins according to the riches of your grace. Help us, Lord, to believe your Bible so that we live by the faith of the Son of God and Christ lives in us and we are ambassadors for Christ. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, next week we'll do uh, start in Galatians 2 and Acts 15. So we'll see you then.